Hey, what's up, 180 family? I'm Mark Schroer, and welcome to the 180 Drums Podcast. This week's episode is very exciting because we have our good friend, Josh Teitelbaum, on the podcast with us. Josh is an absolute expert in groove, and he's going to be breaking down a list of his favorite drummers. We're talking the guys that have paved the road for the drumming community. We're talking guys like Bernard Purdy, Steve Jordan, Steve Gadd, David Garibaldi, just to name a few, and a handful of other killer drummers. Anyways, I hope you enjoy the podcast just as much as I did. Please welcome Josh Teitelbaum and Jake Nicole. Hey guys, welcome to the 180 Drums Podcast. I've got Josh Teitelbaum in the house, and as a matter of fact, I just had to get him to teach me his last name, because it's so ballin'. <laughs> And uh, we're really excited to have Josh on the show today because aside from being a killer drummer out living in L.A., he's also written an amazing article where he's just breaking down and covering everybody imaginable that's got a pocket on the drums. And uh, you can go and check that out by typing in 180drums.com forward slash Josh T. Josh, welcome to the show, man. What's going on, dude? (laughs) Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Now listen, dude, describe to everybody where you are right now. I am in Baltimore right now, despite the fact that I live in Los Angeles and have been there for almost two years now. I have a wedding this weekend, so I'm in rainy Baltimore, um, unlike sunny California, but it's all good. I'm sitting here in a coffee shop and excited to to kick off this podcast, man. Dude, you got to give the rest of us a chance sometimes to have nice weather, right? You got to go and balance (laughs) it out. (laughs) Hey, man, I hear you. Yeah, man. Okay, I'm cool. So, so, dude, you're out in Baltimore, and you're gigging, or you have a buddy's wedding? I have a buddy's wedding. I may do a little jamming in the basement with uh, with my dad and brothers, but I'm primarily here for a wedding. Oh, dude, that's way cool, man. What does your dad <laughs> play? So my dad plays bass, and uh, my younger brother plays keys, and my older brother plays guitar and sings a little bit. Very cool. Now, man, as we jump in, for everybody listening to the podcast right now, the first thing I'd say is you got to go and check out Josh's Instagram right away. So, dude, what's the plug for that? What's the best place for people to go and check out and see what you're you're up to and kind of what you're doing? Wow, man. Um, So my Instagram is just my first name underscore my last name, J-O-S-H underscore T-E-I-T-E-L-B-A-U-M. But all of my social links can be um, can be found from my website. Just first name, last name dot com, Josh dot com. Awesome. Yeah. So guys, check that out. And then I want to definitely encourage you to, if you want links to anything, you can visit the 180drums.com forward slash Josh T link. And we're going to have everything linked up there as well for you guys. Because dude, we've got like a bazillion clips of you in this post. And then what we've done, so for everyone listening to encourage you guys to check this out is I said to Josh, we were talking about uh, a great post that Josh could write. And the thing that sticks out to me about you as a drummer, man, is that you can visibly see and hear the inspiration of all these legendary and iconic drummers in your playing. So I said to Josh, well, dude, why don't you write us an article that highlights a bunch of your favorite drummers? And dude, you came back with like 10, like this massive list of guys that I was not (laughs) anticipating. And uh, man, right away, it just made me realize that we could probably dive in deep. So what drummer do you want to start with the most, man? Do you want to start right at the top of the post or what? Let's do it. I I didn't, um, to be honest, I didn't do it in any sort of particular order. Although naturally for me, Steve Jordan is, is, is at the top of that list. So yeah, we can definitely just dive in right at the top there. So what you're saying is probably after Steve, everything's a little bit debatable, but <laughs> but it starts with Stevie. Yeah, you could uh, you can interpret what I said that way. <laughs> sure, man. Okay, okay, good. I will. Um, so yeah, guys, head over there and check that out. We're gonna be talking through this. You don't have to necessarily follow along, but what I would encourage you guys to do is at some point go over there, check it out, and dig in deep because there's just tons of great content. So really, we're talking about how to improve groove, uh, how to develop pocket, and we're gonna look at these guys. So man, Steve Jordan, dude. Uh, when it comes to Steve Jordan, some of my favorite stuff that he does is definitely with John Mayer on the Continuum record with the Trio, with Keith Richards, uh, just everywhere, dude. What are some gigs that he's played on that really inspire you? 
man. Um, there's there's so many. I have there's so many. I, I have a Spotify playlist that is solely dedicated to like some of my favorite records that Stop. that Steve has played on. I mean, anyone from Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, Brecker Brothers, Solomon Burke, obviously all the Mayor stuff. I mean, the list goes on and on, but. I mean, the dude's pocket is is undeniable. If it's not clear enough from from you know any of my playing or, or my writing, um, and I, I just I can't get enough of the dude. He's just he's really it for me in terms of like one of the best groove players of all time. And just sort of that like play for the song type mentality is really really hits home for me. Well, what's cool, man, is that uh, I think you do a really good job at interpreting his sound, and also. This is something that I've uh, I, that I personally have experienced by sitting in, you know that that seat that coveted seat that I get to sit in at 180 that I uh, I definitely feel very fortunate to sit beside all these heavy players, and one of the biggest things I realize, man, is that they, everybody has a different swagger, and I think that 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 the way you move your body, the dance of playing drums, is largely something that impacts the sound you pull out of the drums. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, that's that's huge for me. Um, yeah, I took you know watching all the dudes who are on 180. Everyone moves differently, and I think that that is you know like you said directly correlates to the way that someone sounds. You can look at Steve Jordan while he's playing and have him on mute, and if you're watching a video of him, and just know that he's grooving his little behind off <laughs> and I, yeah i mean i i totally i can't stress enough how much of what you just said really is is what i'm all about the movement it's it's uh in 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 giving i i've taught a few lessons out in la to like some of the young guys and that's something that i really can't stress enough is like your the, the way that your body moves is fully going to impact the way that you sound and the way that you feel the music and the way that the musicians around you feel your groove and, and impact on the song and the music around you. Man, that's a great way to put it. And before I get too far away from this, how do you feel about sharing your playlist on uh, Spotify? I feel great about it. <laughs> All right, dude, I'm writing that down because we are going to, uh, for everyone listening, again, head to 18drums.com forward slash Josh T. Check out his, his playlist. This is getting better and better, man. <laughs> so, um, you know, the other thing I think that's really interesting when it comes to Steve Jordan is this, is when people talk about groove, a couple things that they might not be fully factoring in or fully thinking about is there's the way you move, there's the way you tune your drums, there's the way you hit your drums, there's the way you place your notes on the drums, there's just so many aspects to creating a sound. So what I think really kind of captures Steve Jordan's sound is like, for one, he's usually got that tight poppy snare. He's usually hitting his rim shots in such a way that it's it's a little bit more like almost like reggae, the way he's usually hitting right. pretty pretty like close to the rim. He's not mm -hmm. he's not playing like a quest love where he's hitting as deep into the drum with a rim shot as possible. He's playing way closer to the edge. Mm -hmm. um, drawing up that sound, he's usually really pumping the hats. Like, there's such a, a swagger about him. But I'd say, like, for anyone that's trying to go interpret Steve Jordan, Josh, what would be your advice, man? Like, you know, I think a playlist is a great place to start. But even just if they were to sit down and try and mimic him, what would be some of the advice you'd give? Go check out his "The Groove Is Here" DVD mm. and watch it. A hundred times, because <laughs> I, I I cannot exhaust that DVD. In fact, on my on my flight last night, I watched that on the way, and I, I've I've seen it minimum a hundred times. I mean, just go watch that over and over again. Go watch any YouTube video that you can find of him, and the more you watch him, the more that 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 movement and that feel will will start to naturally rub off on you, and that's what I feel like it's done to me obviously if you have a chance to go check him out live do not miss that opportunity oh, but, yeah. but go get that dvd that's that's kind of step one is what i would say i'm gonna second that i'm gonna say grab that dvd and then i'm gonna say grab the live in la dvd with john mayer because oh, yeah. 
there's you get to see him play all night long. You get to see JJ play as well, which mm-hmm. we will talk about JJ. Oh yeah, we'll get to JJ. Um, but you get to see both those guys play on one DVD. You know what's a DVD, by the way? But you get to see them play on the DVD. And then you also are going to get to see him in a trio setting where it's pretty bare bones. There's, it's like, there's nothing to hide behind. So you really get to hear Steve kind of out in the open and doing what I think he does best, which is, which is kind of that blues R&B sound, you know? Yeah, man. And one more to, to tack onto that. Get, um, Jake, I don't know if you've checked this out, but James Taylor has a live at the Beacon Stop. from Stop. 1998, and Steve plays on it, and it is incredible. Go check that out. What's it called again? It's live at the Beacon Theater. Okay, I've heard of this for sure. I should oh know this. Oh my god, it's insane. It's young Steve Jordan, but it's you know it's almost 20 years ago, but uh, wow. it's incredible. Wow, man, there's some footage of Steve Jordan. Here's the other thing, is that a lot of guys might not think he's got playing chops, but I have seen some videos. I don't even know. I'll try and uncover um, these videos of him chopping. I'm just writing that down, too, because I want to remember. But Steve Jordan, there's like a video I saw when he's, I want to say he's like in his late teens, early 20s. Yeah. And he is shedding. Have you seen these videos? Uh, yeah, that's like when he was like in his whole fusion zone. Oh, my God goodness yeah. man like guys got chops for days yeah 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 for sure oh ridiculous so yeah there's lots to check out um but i would just encourage you guys like i think josh has brought up some great resources and on the blog that we've written i can't stress enough how well you did a, a great job of putting together and what you guys can see is you're going to actually get to see by going to the blog you're going to see steve jordan play because we've put in a bunch of videos of steve playing and then we've got videos of Josh playing, and you can start to see, like, oh, that's how Josh is getting that sound. That's how he's kind of mimicking the body language or the movement or the tuning and really creating as similar a vibe as possible while still being Josh. So Thank you, man. Yeah. I appreciate those kind words. It means oh, a lot. Dude, it's <laughs> great, man. Even all your captions, I'm, I'm laughing because they're all like, you know, get into the groove of Steve Jordan this week. Steve Jordan inspired. <laughs> Yet another stolen by Steve Jordan. This is a theme, so I dig it, man. Okay, here's one other thing when it comes to sound is big hats. I feel Mm. like he is the godfather of the big hats. Um, I think he uses 17-inch Pisces. Typically, that's his go-to. Yeah. And then the Brady snare is a big part of Steve Jordan's sound. Um, That tight Brady snare, you know, rest in peace Brady as a company, um, which is a huge bummer. But, uh, yeah, man, that's a big part of the sound, too. Totally. I've, I've, I've taken the, the big hats from him for sure. I've got a, a pair of 17s and 16s. Dude. They're, just, they're just so beefy. So Love much them. fun, man. <laughs> so much fun. Okay, so, yeah, definitely, guys, take some time. Dig into Steve Jordan stuff. I feel like we don't have to talk about Steve Jordan too much longer because a lot of you probably already are huge fans and are cringing at the fact that we didn't have more to share on Steve specifically <laughs> related to DVDs. So, Please shoot me an email, leave us some comments, jake at 180drums.com. Let us know what's inspiring you guys in terms of Steve Jordan or in terms of any of the drummers we're talking about today. Steve Gad. Another Steve. Another Steve. Dude, walk me through Steve Gad. Man, um, another one of like the session masters um, has played with one of my favorite artists, including but not limited to Steely Dan, B.B. King, James Taylor, Clapton, and a million others. Um, such an identifiable sound, such a pioneer in groove, in musicality, in playing for the song. Um, his influence on me is massive. And most, I mean, he's a, he's a household name for drummer for not only drummers but most all musicians um Mm. he's just that guy that every musician no matter what instrument you play you know the name steve gadd because he's played on hundreds of records and it's just sort of like that that go-to guy of of our generation that he just he kills everything that he's on (laughs) yeah i've I've gotten the opportunity to see him a couple times live one um with james had like a, a big uh a big arena type thing. And then I also saw him at a Catalina jazz club in, in LA, like a smaller joint. And I mean, he's, I think he's 
approaching, if not 70 years old. Does that sound right? That really does, man. Um, and he's still killing it. He's still killing it, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah. What I what I love about Steve Gadd so much is I love that he got into the drums late, a little bit later in life in some ways, uh, playing in the military, mm -hmm. if, if I've got that correct. Yeah. And playing jazz primarily within the military, probably some big band stuff as well. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure, I hope we've got some like Steve Gatt historians that are going to correct us on some stuff and teach us <laughs> even more. That would be great. Yeah, right? That would be great. I'm open to that. Uh, but here's here's my favorite thing about Steve Gadd, and this this might be I don't know we'll see we'll see how people feel about me saying this, but I feel like Steve Gadd visibly has uh, has a bag of tricks that he pulls out, mm -hmm. and what I love about that is that it's it's a sound he he instead of having like an infinite like vocabulary, he decided to kind of almost limit himself to a few series of fills that he'll use um the way he approaches his grooves is often mm -hmm. quite similar yeah and he hits his drums in such a way that it's so um loose and yet in the pocket and tight at the exact same time um it's just so cool man he's got such a cool thing because he's almost has more freedom because of the the limitations that he's put on his own playing does that make sense i i could not agree with you more um a few things that I want to hit on there. He almost, like, back to sort of, like, the relaxed thing, he almost has this, like, slouch and, like, like almost, like, laziness to the way that he appears when he plays. But I think that allows him the, the looseness to, to sort of, like, become one with the groove and, like, he's, he's not, like... Because you'll, you'll see some player, and, and not to knock anyone who who is like super tight and sits up right and there's tons of players out there who, who have that posture and can groove their ass off but steve on the other hand is like so loose and so relaxed and that definitely um you can hear that in his playing um, mm. and, and, I, and i love it and, and then and then sort of like his his sound being limited by his, his the way that he forms grooves and like his i i I really do agree with that. Like you'll you'll often hear similar ideas or, or plays off of like those you know snare paradiddle type things <laughs> that he like interjects in, into his grooves, but so smoothly and only at a time where in the song it it, it feels right. Um, yeah, he's again one of those like play for the song type drummers, and it's no wonder that he's been on so many of these timeless classic records um, and is is a favorite among so many of our, our favorite artists yeah um man i really i really am blown away by steve gadd and i'm i'm thinking of this video that we're gonna put in the blog it wasn't in the blog while we live discussed this josh and i right now but it's in there now so go check it out and it's this video it's weckle <laughs> gadd in yeah. the middle yeah and and Cayuda on the end yeah and here's the thing Vinny and, and Dave Weckl are, are amazing drummers. Like, they are the epitome of having chops, having speed, having feel. Like, they, they really have it all in a lot of ways. And yet, Josh, what happens, mm -hmm. man? What ha to, From your perspective, before I say anything, what would you say happens in that video that's fascinating? It's not, it's not right or wrong. Some people, you know, and it's not a win or lose type thing. But for me... As a drummer, for me as a musician, I dig Gad's playing more because to me, it's more musical. And again, that's my opinion. I want to stress that. Others will say that they dig Weckl or they dig Caliuta more. Um, and again, no one wins or loses. But for me personally, I just like the way that Gad has these memorable phrases that that can that you can sing back, whereas oh. Weckl and Caliuta might be you know, blowing chops all around the kit and it's incredible and very commendable. But the fact that I can sing back dad's licks is to me, hits home more for me. You just nailed it, man. Like what you see happen is you see exactly that he does. He does something memorable that I would say to, to even add to what you're saying, he does something that the audience can actually simply take into, right? Mm -hmm. He does something that 
people listening during that performance, they can latch on to that cowbell groove when he gets to the section right. where, and I bet you Weckle, <laughs> I bet mm-hmm. you Dave Weckle and Vinny Cayuta went backstage and probably, <laughs> if they didn't say it out loud, thought to themselves, crap, man, I should have been the guy to lay down the groove. <laughs> I should have just simplified it and like, yeah. you know, because yeah. Steve Gadd almost gives us a lesson. I feel like he is less... He has way less chops than those guys. Let's be honest. Oh, yeah. I've never yeah. seen him use like play like those guys, technically or otherwise. Right. And yet he gives us a lesson in what appeals to people and what people get and what moves people. And it's not flash. It's totally. feel. Yep. So, All about the feel and the musicality of it and the, and the phrasing. The yes, phrasing. Is phrasing. Crazy. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So much feel. But you're right. I love – I think you said it perfect. You said it perfect when you said it's singable. It has, it, there's a melody to his playing. Exactly. So we've got, again, tons of clips for you guys to check out on, you know, the dot com, 180drums.com forward slash Josh T. And we've also got a bunch of videos of you, man. How do you feel your videos measure up to, to Gad? <laughs> that, that's a lot of I do question. my best, man. I mean, you know, I've certainly been influenced by him. I, I don't know that I've ever, like, spent. A, an extended period of time trying to like cop his licks it's more about his feel rubbing off on me and sort of like that that laziness and groove and the way that he fits his hearts to songs and that type of thing versus like you know someone else who I, I might be trying to cop their licks you know what I mean well definitely what I wanted to commend you on right away is that I felt like with the videos you chose they're videos that really well highlight what would capture some of Gad so like the Gadisms vibe the fact that you went for the Mozambique which oh, is oh yeah that's a classic Gad classic <laughs> Gad classic Gad yeah so that's really cool man I dig that focusing on the bell because so much of what Gad does that turns your head is where he goes to the bell and you're just mm-hmm. like come on man yeah come on <laughs> okay so moving away from Gad we we jump back just a little bit maybe you know a decade or two Tell us about Mr. Gadsden. Dude. Oh, my God. James Gadsden. Um, I mean, I, I can I can spend a whole day talking about his playing with Bill Withers because it has had yes. such a massive, massive influence on me and so many other drummers. He is such a groove player. He is so in the pocket, and he is so funky, man. Like, I, I mean, he's, he's one of my all-time favorites, obviously. Um, his playing is just so smooth and so groovy and and it's it it has such a big impact on on bill withers sound and and the way that his records come across and 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 the hits that he's created so dude james gadson crazy crazy group okay man before we even (laughs) talk about songs i'm realizing i blew it in not mentioning uh by not mentioning a few steve gad songs that you can listen to him on so 40 40 ways to leave your lover is 50 ways 50 ways (laughs) oh shoot that's the worst so i would say um maybe the uh uh, steely dan's asia record is a really like classic one to check out um I mean, there's there's so many that I can. I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but like a ton of a ton of James Taylor stuff, a ton of Steely Dan stuff. Like I said, some BB King stuff, Clapton. Um, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah, man. I think he played on some. Did he play on some Aretha Franklin stuff? Maybe early on. Maybe. You know what? I actually I don't, don't know. know. I mean, the Chick Corea stuff's amazing too, man. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Totally. That's totally. amazing too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's some stuff for you guys to go check out. Now, when it comes to Gadsden, uh, I was really happy to see right away that you put "Kissing My Love" in there. That feel, and mm. you're right. Like those songs would not be the same without that groove, man. And uh, much like. You know, we, we talked about Steve Jordan's movement, Steve Gadd. We, we talked about his posture, but another one that you could turn turn the sound off and just know that he is just laying down the thickest groove. Gadsden is another one that the, the way he moves and bounces has just such a big part of the way that his sound comes across and the way that his groove is felt. Yeah, big time, man. Uh 
yeah, man. Like he is uh, his ability. I'd say what what is one particular feature of his sound is just the hi hat work, man. Mm -hmm. Like the feel and placement on the hi hat is the best. It's so good, man. So definitely, guys, like take some time to dig into that and uh, try and mimic, even just playing along to those songs and copying just the hi hat work and seeing if you can get that swing and that feel, man. So good. Use, yeah. Use me. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Um, I try to play that song as much. As, and there's a few. Kissing my love, use me, and then there's another tune that I just try to play almost every time I sit down and practice to just try and have that sort of feel seep into my playing. Um, and I will tell you the tune. It is called "Back at the Chicken Shack." by jimmy smith it's just got this like super swingy very subtle groove that like it's just you know it's 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 more about the feel than what he's actually playing it's it's got a little of that like sort of swampiness meets jazz meets funk it's it's so good dude so good man yeah the, and there's so many songs that bill withers has done that are so iconic ain't no sunshine mm -hmm. um Tons of stuff, man. So uh, your videos too, man. They do a gr again. You do a great job, dude, of of even blending some of the drummers. Like we see you blending some Zig and Gadsden. Uh, you know, focusing on again. It's funny. Like right away, I think the thing that that captures what you're going for is the hi hat work, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. Cool, man. Bernard Purdy. Purdy, Purdy, pretty Purdy. Oh, come on. Now, when it comes to Purdy, if anyone's unaware who Bernard Purdy is, uh, I actually feel jealous of you because you're about to have <laughs> a new favorite drummer. Like, discovering him for the first time is going to be a joy. Yeah. And you're going to realize how much his playing has influenced so much of what's gone on, whether it's, you know, Bonham, whether it's uh, even with Jeff Picaro and Toto. Like, you hear oh, yeah. this shuffle, the Purdy shuffle everywhere everywhere yes. so that's one thing i mean but come on like james brown aretha franklin you gotta be kidding me it's insane bb king i mean the, he's he is there there's a few i, I don't know if, if it's self-proclaimed but he's definitely in like the top five most recorded drummers ever um i mean steely dan fats domino joe cocker bob dylan like the beatles <laughs> I, Dude, it's 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 said that he's replaced some of Ringo's parts. I think that's still up for. I I think it's like sort of a controversial topic, so we don't need to dive down that. But um, I mean, his his credit list is is unbelievable. It's I'm outrageous. glad you said it first because I was gonna dive a little bit into it just to say that uh, it's it's totally interesting, man. To I would encourage you guys to at least. Google it and read into it a little bit because it's really fascinating yeah. to hear Bernard's take on feeling feeling as though he played on played over a lot of Ringo's parts before the Beatles had broke. That's the claim. Was right. that he had played on stuff, he had been asked to go into the studio and replace parts uh, which he later believed to be the Beatles and Ringo's right. parts. So right. pretty crazy story, man. It is. And I'm, I'm actually mid his, uh, he put out, I don't know if it was an autobiography or biography, but he put out a book recently um, that I'm like halfway through along with like three other books and I'm halfway through, but that, that would be something cool to check out for all you out there. Yeah. So, I mean, myself, I feel like naturally because I, I'm a big reader and I love reading that we've amassed uh, a following of drummers who also read. I've got guys that message me that are both in the 180 family and guys that are fans of following 180 who are hitting me up all the time being like, dude, I'm reading this book. I'm checking yeah. this out. So dude, what are some books you're reading and what's the name of Bernard Purdy's book? So um, one book I'm reading right now is called Mastery. And it's sort of, um, it's by a brilliant author named Robert Greene. Um, and it has like, the same sort of sentiments as, or similar sentiments as Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers book. Come on. Um, and sort of like achieving mastery, and it can be, and it can be related to anything. Um, 
But and, and so that's really good. I'm I'm almost on that one. Um, Bernard Purdy's book is called "Let the Drums Speak." Cool. Um, and then what's another book that I recently dove into? Um, I'm drawing blanks here, so forgive me. I'll get back to you. But there's there's a couple books couple other books that I'm like sort of halfway through um, just because I get excited about the next thing and I you know want to jump to it and have sort of ADD in that way but it's good because I'm just kind of soaking up all this knowledge from different perspectives as I'm sure you can heavily relate to Uh, I love dude I love right away that you referenced it as running in tandem with Malcolm Gladwell because anything by Malcolm Gladwell is if you yeah. guys, if you guys are interested in reading at all, and you know what, I would go as to far as far as to say, if you're curious in any way about the world, about patterns that happen in the world, about culture, go read Malcolm Gladwell's books. I mean, it's just, it's so eye-opening to hear perspectives and to draw parallels between things that you thought previously unrelated. Uh, it's just, it's brilliant. So. Check that out, and dude, I'm gonna read Master. You better believe it. I've got it open here in front of me. I'm looking at the, uh, looking at a bit of the review. It looks like a great book. Yeah, man, it's a really good one. The other one that I'm that I've read once, but I'm about to start again. It's called The Inner Game of Music. Have you heard of that one? I have not. It's it's based on a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. That's all about sort of like the psychology of of high performers and like how you can sort of calm your nerves and that's sort of like the whole. You know, very high level way of thinking about the book, um, but has been um, uh, transcribed, for lack of a better word, to different activities. Music being one, I'm sure there's like sort of a business version. There's different variations of this book, but I read one called The Inner Game of Music, and it was a really, really great read. Now, that's too you, funny. You, you would dig that one. The author is Barry Green, is that correct? Yes. What's so funny is the last author you mentioned was Robert Green. Look at that. (laughs) Something about if I change my last name to Green, it sounds like my chances are improving. Couldn't hurt. That's for sure. Couldn't hurt, man. (laughs) Could not hurt. Okay, cool, man. So I love that we're diving into books a little bit because, uh, yeah, and first of all, I mean, just go, go dig into a ton of Bernard stuff. Do you happen to have a Bernard playlist too? What other playlists are you hiding out on us, man? (laughs) I mean, you're inspiring me to create one for all these guys. I don't have a Bernard one, but he's certainly like in my library of music amongst different artists in my Spotify. Well, I'm writing down right now. Spotify. You're gonna give me some homework, man. I think I'll what I'm gonna <laughs> from all these guys. <laughs> because you know what, man? Like, even if even if everyone listening, everybody in the 180 family, all y'all had even just four tracks to hear from each guy. Like, whatever whatever comes to mind, Josh, dude, you are just so. I, after looking at this list, I realized that you have such a great ability to dig into each guy. The videos you picked were the videos that, you know, for the guys that I know well, I would have picked. Like, you just have great taste, man, in, Thank um, you, man. in these drummers, dude. I'm so impressed. So, definitely, guys. I, I think there's, I think, you know, not to um, proceed the rest of our conversation but there's definitely like a common thread between all these guys and that is like they're like i've said it a few times so sorry for exhausting this phrase but playing for the song is such an important thing that's that's always hit home for me um and nothing like i totally respect all the the chop dudes out there and and sort of like the the gospel stuff and i i love all that there's a side of me that loves all that but for me i i love like these dudes because they can lay down the thickest grooves and just play exactly what's necessary for the song and as we go on to the rest of these players you know it's it's definitely a common thread for all these dudes big time man and this next guy has easily become one of my favorite drummers uh within the last i'd say that within the last four or five years he's easily become one of my favorite players and he is an avid reader, dude. This guy's posting books all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Before I even say his name, uh, do you want to do you want to start with his like Gunger, John Mayer? Who else has he played for, dude? Um, I mean, he's he's cut 
maybe hundreds of records. It was initially in Nashville, dude, and I moved to L.A. I don't know how long ago, but, I mean, um, Sarah Bareilles, Ben Rector, um, Glenn Campbell. I mean, to be at Shakira, like, all over the map. I, I initially, truth be told, found out about him because of the, the stuff that he cut with John Mayer. But then that sort of forced me by curiosity to, to check out a lot of his discography and found out that he is just this, I mean, like one of the best session players today. And uh, as far as I'm concerned of all time, he's, he's yes. incredible. Yeah. He is a serial, he's a serial recording artist. I mean, yep. it's, it's insane. Like if you were to just type in Aaron Sterling and then there's a little Wikipedia thing or a little Google thing on the side, right? You can click on Associated Acts and hit more, and you're going to see John Mayer, Taylor Swift, Sarah Bareilles, yeah. Richie Sambora. You're going to see uh, uh, Regina Spector. You're going to see Glenn Campbell. You're yeah. going to see just everybody, Gavin DeGraw, Kelly Clarkson, Tasha uh -huh. Bedingfield. It's insane, dude. It's crazy. It's insane. crazy. So we're talking about Aaron Sterling, guys. <laughs> it, his Instagram is at Sterloid. So you can just S-T-E-R-L-O-I-D. Go on there because the dude is listing an insane amount of uh, books that he's reading. And even better for everybody because they'll relate to this is, is he's been putting up drum tutorial videos. He's been kind of walking himself through and everyone who gets involved, he's walking them all through how he records, how he chooses drums, how he fixes drums that suck. And, and makes a crappy sounding drum into something beautiful. The guy is just unreal, man. So have unreal. you checked out his um, his masterclass thing that he put up? The go I, online thing. I have been dying to sit and just <laughs> go through it and write a review of the whole thing because I definitely plan to. Um, you know, maybe yeah, maybe I should just buy one. Have you already got it? I so I have a very short unread portion of my gmail inbox and that is one of them because it is a, a, an immediate intention of mine to purchase and just sit down for a few hours and like just geek out over it because i've heard it's incredible um jay reynolds who you know a uh, buddy of mine out here in la awesome drummer he uh he recently watched it and urged me to pull the trigger on it so i am uh one of these days in the very near future i'm gonna sit down and, and, and give it a go Oh, I love it. Yeah, guys, go check out Jay Reynolds, too. Uh, Jay Reynolds is... What up, Jay? <laughs> Jay's the man. Such a good dude. Another guy who's, you know, working hard in L.A. He has some of the, the most beautiful drums I've ever seen. The guy's got a ridiculous collection of, like, Craviados and, you know, <laughs> Tama Bell Brass snare drums. He's such a jerk that way. And uh, the other thing that's really cool is I actually met Jay for the first time when... Uh, New Kids on the Block was in town, and we yeah. had Stevie. We had uh, Stevie Wonder as well, his drummer Stanley Randolph, come mm. to the studio. And that day, I went sat uh, beside his kit. It was kind of in this weird spot on the floor where he's like almost in the crowd, pretty well in the crowd, and sat with Jay and watched the whole show. And met Jay then, and he was teching. But Jay's Jay is far beyond just being a drum tech. Uh, you know, not saying that being a drum tech is not enough, because there are masters in that. But Jay is also an extraordinary drummer. So, oh yeah. So go check that cat out. And yeah, man, it's uh. And an aside, who has one of the best seats that he sits in on a weekly basis in the entire world right now? Stanley Randall. Dude. Dude. Stevie Wonder. Are you Come kidding me? On. <laughs> and he couldn't be more humble. I mean, Stanley, my man, uh, we love you, dude. He's just St – Stanley's like one of the nicest guys I've ever met, man. Just so hard to upset, so easygoing. His his social media um, <laughs> persona, because it's still a part of who he is, he's like ultra outgoing, ultra high energy. And then when you hang with Stanley, he's just the coolest cat, man. He's the coolest dude. So – no, nothing but love for Stanley, man. And that yeah, gig man. with Stevie is crazy. I actually got the honor. He invited me to that gig when they were in town last. And I got to meet Stevie. And oh, man. Dude, that whole crew, like, they're just the nicest people. It's it's it's, it's insane. Um, so bringing it back to Aaron Sterling, this guy is just 
He's been killing it lately. My introduction was John Mayer, actually. Yeah. Because I'm such a, I'm definitely such a fan in terms of uh, the music that John Mayer has created. And, you yeah. Know, the soundtrack that it's been to different parts of my life. Oh yeah, me and, too, man. <laughs> dude, and like I've got a funny little story. Did I tell you about the snare drum that I bought from Aaron at all? I don't think you showed that one. Well, right? I've got a good Aaron Sterling story. Aaron, if you're listening. Uh, you're still the man. I thought this was <laughs> I thought this was comical. I had bought a drum off of Aaron. Uh, he posted through his website, AaronSterling.com. Go check it out. That he was selling a couple of his drums and cymbals, and one of them was like a 15 by 8, 15 by 8, huh. Lady Ludwig. This really old, super beat up drum. Uh, not a collector's by any mean, but a collector's in terms of its sound. Just a really cool drum. Right. So I bought the drum off of him, uh, received the drum, had it for about a full year, and never really played it because it almost just became this like collector's item for me, you know? Right, right. He, you know, told me that he had used it on some, some mare rehearsals and a bunch of stuff. So I was just kind of geeking out. I thought it was really yeah. cool to have. For sure. A year later, I get a Twitter message. And it's from Aaron Sterling. And I'm like, this must be like a spam message, like an accident or something, right? Right. And I open it up. And this is going back. This, this is a few years ago now. And long before 180 existed. So I open up this, this email. And he's like, hey, dude, I sold you a drum that I didn't realize belonged to a friend. It had just kind oh of, my God. it fell into my collection. And, uh, and, you know, I feel bad that I sold it. He goes, you don't have to give it back, but I'd really appreciate it if you did. And I can either refund you or send you another drum. So I was like, dude, oh what else God. do you got? He's like, man, well, you said you're a Mare fan. He's like, I've got the drum that we used on Shadow Days. It's yours if you want it. I was oh, like, man. done deal, done deal. So we swapped we swapped drums, and uh, he, he was gracious enough to throw in a pair of hi-hats for the trouble, which was just awesome. So, dude, so Aaron's incredible. Aaron's a really cool dude, man, and uh, and he chooses very cool drums. He chooses drums that are probably worthless by most people's standards. What was the drum that he wound up sending to you? Six and a half by fourteen Slingerland. I want to cool. say it was like a '60s or '70s Slingerland, um, nice. and it had it has like a single flange hoop. It's a really cool drum, man. And again. I have not played it a ton. And side note, every drum I've received from Aaron, this is comical to me. Every both both times I got those drums includes a book. No, that would be amazing. <laughs> Come on, that'd be amazing. They are covered in duct tape. Like yeah, like yeah. I'm talking duct tape and gaff tape, just everywhere <laughs> on the snare heads. Love so it. fun little side note there with Aaron. But yeah, guys, like just go and dig into anything and everything Aaron's played on to get a sense of his very wide uh you know sound sound options like his palette when it comes to sound is so is so vast yeah, yeah. as well as his style he's got a sound but he also is a chameleon it's so cool mm -hmm. and i have to plug the podcast that aaron did on the uh i'd hit that dude it's so just so good i think he's done oh. two right or am i making that up you could be too. correct. I've I've only heard his first one, and he shares some of the the gnarliest stories of like playing with David Lee Roth and. Huh. Yeah. I'd hit that as another like, just go check it. Love that. I've listened to a ton of those. Yeah, man. What I love about what he does is the fact he's just sitting in the room with guys. It is such a great, great, great podcast. So. Yeah. Definitely go check that out. Um. Cool, man. Let's let's talk about Zigaboo. Let's do it, man. Um, Zig. I was introduced to Zig by one of my very first drum teachers in high school who played Sissy Strut for me. And that was the first oh. meter, meters tune that I had ever heard. And it was game over from there. I went and dug into like all of their records. And I've just spent the last 10, 15 years just picking up all of Zig's stuff and his just swampy groovy funkiness that is just unmatched by anyone it's crazy he's one of my favorites of all time for sure so for everybody listening what's a couple ways that they can really dig into his playing obviously zigaboo model least with the meters like that's that's the kind of that's the crown of what he worked on 
simultaneously though, I would say go check out the Stanton Moore DVD, Groove Alchemy. Are yeah, you, you, you know what? I've I've seen I've seen clips of that. I haven't checked out the in it in, in its entirety. Um, okay. That's on my list though. So yeah, thank you for reminding me. Well, I'm gonna urge you just the way Jay urged you to go check out Aaron's stuff. Uh, <laughs> I honestly think everyone listening needs a copy of Groove Alchemy. Wow, if not nice. the DVD, I think everyone needs a copy of the book because Stanton went out of his way to develop a book that has grooves that covers actually quite a few guys we're talking about. There's a whole lot on Clyde Stubblefield, which we're gonna talk about in a second, a whole lot on Zig. Um, and a whole lot on James Gadsden. Like it is, mm. it is an amazing book when it comes to the origin of funk, man. The origin of R and B. The origin of swung playing. It's just so, so detailed. And what's really cool is you can tell Stanton is really close friends with Zigaboo, and has spent a lot of time dissecting what I'd say. I'd say he is the closest thing to like being a reincarnation <laughs> of of uh, still living Zigaboo, you know? Yeah, man, he is uh, so steeped in that New Orleans sound. I, I've gotten a chance to meet Stan and seen him play like very cr- close proximity several times. And man, can that guy groove his ass off. He is an incredible player. And like you said, he you can just tell that he has studied those cats so hard and does such an incredible job emulating their style, but obviously making it his own and uh he's yeah i can't say enough about stan he's an insane player yeah definitely man so guys go check out the meters uh they just have they have so much good stuff it's 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 hard to kind of not i think you have to just simply immerse yourself in the music yeah drive around for a little while and only listen to the meters have it have it loaded on your phone have it ready to go and just immerse yourself yeah, and you know what? I had a I had a tough time. I mean, granted, I didn't spend an insane amount of time looking, but I had a tough time finding like old videos of Zig, like with the meters. I'm sure they're out there somewhere, but like at least in the first few pages of YouTube, like I had a tough time. I don't know if you have any secrets to finding old clips of Zig, but uh, so I just thought it would be you know important to just check out all of all of his stuff with the meters and all the stuff that he did with everyone else. And just like you said, play it incessantly and just let that like sort of naturally steep into your ears and it'll find its way into your playing for sure. I think you're right. I don't think there is a whole lot of, of Zig that you can really come across out there. And that's probably why I gravitated toward and put so much of an emphasis on studying, you know, studying the stuff that, uh, you know, that Stanton Moore was putting out there because it was just yeah. the closest thing, right? Yeah, totally. All right, man. Walk us through. Who do we got next? We got the funky drummers, Clyde and Jabo. Um, you know, just dude, arguably the funkiest drummers ever to live. Um, yeah. Ever will live. Uh, I mean, their, their work with James Brown, amongst others, has had a permanent effect on the landscape of funk and soul and R&B music. Uh. They're, they're sampled like hundreds of times on hip hop and, you know, other modern stuff. Um, they just, the, the funkiness and the grooviness is just an impossible thing to deny. And they have had an incredibly large impact on my playing and just overall sense of groove and I've also impacted most every one of the guys that I'm listing here that came after them so yeah um, great point yeah they're credited to just you know with influence on on all these guys so man I can't say enough about (laughs) both of them and and sort of their their historic impact on on music in general R&B music in general Man, yeah, I think to fully wrap your, like for everybody listening, go and watch as much as you can on James Brown, Mm -hmm. and I think what will happen out of that is it's really going to inform you as to the gravity of what, you know, Clyde and Jabo were a part of, Mm -hmm. as well as the fact that my understanding was 
James Brown would go as far as to have, I think, five to seven drummers set yeah. up on stage <laughs> because people couldn't keep up with the pace. Right. And because it was just so fast, so much going on, so high intensity. Yeah. That it got to the point where my understanding is both Clyde and Jabbo uh, had at some point cornered each other backstage and were like, listen, let's ditch all these other guys and just be the only two dudes doing this thing because we don't need these other guys, right? Wow, man. I haven't heard that story, but I believe it. That's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, dude. I watched the documentary. First of all, James Brown, like he would have been one of the hardest performers ever to work with because oh yeah if you made a mistake what he would do is he, he would picture like uh if you know sign language like you know making an o just making an o with your hand and then and then opening up all your fingers real fast like flicking your fingers from your thumb that meant like docking you 50 bucks right docking you pay yeah hopefully yeah. not 50 bucks because that's probably all these guys made in a night <laughs> yeah. but like i think it was something like five or ten bucks every mistake like yeah. off your pay which Crazy. which at that time was like you know was like your food for the day right i almost wish that like the band leaders that i work with did that to me that would like kick my ass and force me to Dude. you know <laughs> true <laughs> enough incredible man. so you know they've got a crazy background but my you know what they talk about in this in this documentary i watched on james brown was in fact that both these guys kind of kind of tried to corner the scene and and ditch everyone else that was involved because they didn't want to share the gig they wanted to be the guys you know right 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 so man wow. what a story dude what a story all right moving on to mr john bonham mm. dude talk talk to me about john bonham another one that was introduced by my um I, I, so I think it was sort of simultaneous. I was asked to learn Sissy Strut and Full in the Rain, and they just oh, knocked cool. my socks off, both of those grooves. And subsequently, I you know, was just motivated to check out all the stuff. And all the stuff that John Bonham played with Led Zeppelin was, I mean, much like Jabo and Clyde informed the landscape of funk and soul and R&B music, I mean, rock music would not be the same without John Bonham. He, like, there, mu music today would be, popular music would be so much different if John Bonham never existed. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the power that he played with, the groove that he played with, but he also had these incredible chops and, like, he just was such a heavy drummer, so groovy, so perfect for the Led Zeppelin sound, which went on to influence so much of rock music today man there's a whirlwind of stuff that we could talk about with john bottom <laughs> i think because i went through and i still go always go back to john bottom's sound i mean he is one of those guys that stanton moore is heavily influenced by yeah Elon rubin is heavily influenced by yeah Dave Grohl is heavily influenced by the, the, yeah man the list would go on and on of iconic drummers that have come from the vision that John Bonham had for the sound of the drums. Yeah. A couple really important things that I think you need to do anytime you find a drummer that inspires you. And I've talked about this a lot on 180. I've talked about this in our lessons. When as soon as a drummer comes up, I always try to f create the frame of mind that allows people to say, well, who was John Bonham's inspiration? Because. Right. If you can zero in on, if you can go back to the source of the sound, you almost get a little bit of a deeper insight into why they were going for the, the sound choices and the grooves that they were going for. So, agree more. Yeah, dude. So one of the, like, John Bonham was really big into Little Richard. Yep. Yeah. The intro to rock and roll is actually, I can't remember if it's a Little Richard song or another song, but he's actually c completely ripping off. Uh, a line that a musician's playing and I think it's a Little Richard song and I could be incorrect on that and, and feel free to write me and let me know the correct correct story there but John Bonham is, is that, in, that rock and roll intro is completely him pulling from his own inspiration yeah it's that it's that I mean he just completely morphed like that old sort of rock and roll rockabilly type thing and, and just like made it this this iconic intro that 
I mean, every drummer has tried to cop, and it's, yeah, it's straight. Like, I, I, I don't know exactly the tune, but Little Richard sounds right um, as, as the source of that. Um, yeah, man, go, go check out who he checked out, and you will find why he plays the way that he does and how he's gone on to, you know, influence so many other that have come after him. Yeah. I think another important thing to note with John Bonham that's super cool is how young he was when he was doing these recordings. We think of yeah. him as old because he's mm-hmm. no longer with us. Yeah. But he was a young guy, man, late tw- mid to late 20s, early yeah. 30s. Like, that's crazy. crazy. Crazy, crazy. I often think of Elon Rubin, man, because he is such a reincarnation of John Bonham's sound. Yeah. But almost like, you know, uh, innovated a little bit further, right? Right, right, yeah. Totally. Big, big fan. And, you know, the other thing with Bonham is his setup, dude. Talk us through his setup. Do you know the specs on his kit? I can give it my best shot. Did He, he either played a 24 or 26 inch Ludwig. Well, he played Ludwig. Did he play a 24 or 26? He was a 26, 14, 26. 16, 18. 18, yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. man. And he was he was a, a super guy. I think a lot of people think he's a black beauty. He played a Supra. Yeah, I have the, the six and a half by 14, usually a Superphonic. That's the one, man. Yeah, yep. Um, other things that stand out is that he didn't use massive cymbals. Uh, I think that that's, that's surprising to a lot of people. I think he actually played a pair of 15 inch hats. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to say like 16 and 18 inch crashes. Okay. And then uh, I think he did play a 24 inch ride though. Um, So he had a big ride symbol, but I don't think he played as big, as big of crashes as we do nowadays at all. And the, the thing that's interesting as well is how high he tuned his drums. Like they all had notes, you know? Yeah, man. And you know what? That's, um, it's sort of like, uh, um, in a way, for some reason, you would maybe think that he's playing these massive drums, so they're going to be like, you know, sort of thuddy, low tune. But that's also something that's translated to, I think that's influenced Steve Jordan. He plays, like, for some reason, I don't know, it could just be me. I, when, I think that by looking at his kid and knowing the types of, type of music he plays, it would be like sort of a lower tom sound, but he tunes his stuff really high, and I have to believe that's partially influenced from from John Bonham. Oh man, for sure, dude, absolutely. I mean, like you said earlier, so much of uh, so much of the guys on on you know on even this list, and the dudes that have come and created massive sounding rock records, a lot of it's his influence and tuning and everything, you know. Yep. Totally. Yeah, yeah, man. Craziness. So, uh, okay, cool, man. I feel like we've we've talked a bunch about John, but you said it. You said it also perfect earlier when you said we could talk, probably talk about him forever. Um, <laughs> I could talk about all these guys forever. <laughs> no kidding, man. Uh, but guys, just go and dig into all of Led Zeppelin stuff. Don't just get hung up on the things that most popularized the band. Right. Dig past that and check out some of the the more the more like you know the later records that are far less listened to. Yeah. And hear how he continued to kind of expand on his own playing and even hearing a, a little bit more Latin influence start yeah. to come in some of the later stuff. Totally. Yeah, man. All right, dude. Who do we got next? So we have the Motown drummers. There's oh. a, a, maybe a few more than, than I've listed, but the main ones that stick out to me are Benny Benjamin, Uriel Jones, and, and Kissel Allen. Come on. Um, and, you know, I've always been back from, you know, being a little kid and running around my house to like early Stevie Run- Wonder stuff when my parents were playing. I've always been like a huge, huge Motown guy. It's had such a massive influence on on my overall musicality and taste of music um, and, and was really um, inspired to check out the drummer's from watching um, the Standing in the Shadows of Motown documentary. Have you seen that? That one? is the one, man. Yeah, that the is a brothers. must, a must, a must watch. Um, and these dudes are so much a part of and so responsible for for the sound of Motown. I mean, they, they, the grooves that they created, while you can easily see where they come from and what inspired them, 
they put a twist on the sound and made this thing their own that has then gone on to influence all of popular music today. So, I mean, these three dudes especially are so responsible for so much of today's music. It's crazy. And so much, you know, we've been to the landscape of, of what, you know, who who has come after them that was inspired by them and, and the music that's come from it. So, yeah, man, they, they are have made such a crazy um, contribution to the overall Motown sound, which has, like I said, then gone on to inspire so many beyond them. Easily my personal, I think my favorite Motown uh, act would have had to have been The Temptations. Yeah, man. And when it comes to the song Ain't Too Proud to Beg, there's mm. so much classic, not only groove in that, but that fill off the top is our yep. six-stroke roll that has just been like, you know, so I feel like it's really come to light in maybe just the last two decades where it's really been, you know, that much more, you know, popularized. Right. And that could be a really ignorant comment, but I no, think, that's... yeah, it feels that way, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah, man. So, dude, just some super heavy drummers. And that documentary is, it's pretty mind bending too, how, how little these guys were paid and, you know, how much they were taken advantage of. And in some ways, I think that that frustration is a lot, like, it, it almost translates into the music, you know? Yeah. In like a really, like in a really humble way, right? Like, everyone's struggling and striving and competing to keep their spots on the gig. And it just, it just rose the, rose the bar in terms of uh, the level of excellence they brought to their playing. Yes, totally. And, it, and it's so crazy that that documentary over the past over the past five years, I would say, there's been like a few others that have, you know, echoed the sentiment of that documentary. I don't know if you've seen like the Muscle Shoals documentary, the 20 Feet from Stardom documentary. Uh, have you seen any of those? No, I'm trying to write those down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check those out. Like all the stuff that came from Muscle Shoals, it's the same thing that the sort of lack of recognition that all of these incredibly talented session players that have you know recorded so much of what we listen to and consider like the the best music that's ever been recorded you don't know these dudes names and yet they're they're the reason that you know so much of the great music that's been created in history has been created um so definitely go check those out dude this is your lifetime list josh this is like uh a full life of learning to play drums, man. And I, I know I mentioned it sort of in the intro, but this is by no means like a comprehensive list of all my influences, but rather, you know, some of the top dudes who, who come to top of mind when thinking about sort of my style, my feel, my playing, my group. So, um, yeah, I just want to sort of put that out there. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. Um, you put in... The next drummer being Stevie Wonder. Yeah, oh, man. Josh, isn't Stevie Wonder <laughs> just a singer, man? Is just a keyboard player? Contrary to popular belief, the dude can slay on the drums. Dude has. There's there's a few albums where he plays nearly every instrument, drums included, and there are some incredible clips of him. Um, I don't know if I included one. Yeah, I did include one. Yep. But there's a few in YouTube land of him just destroying it and he's so groovy but like also has wicked chops too which is crazy <laughs> he's he's an animal and it's it's no it's no wonder no pun intended that he is just like i mean he's he's my top 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 of all time artist but also one of my favorite drummers of all time oh dude so cool man um when it comes to stevie i think i think one thing right away that you said that blows a lot of people's minds is that he is the recording drummer on a lot of the most famous you recordings you've heard of stevie he's playing drums on them so as a really small one-off example super superstition that's yep. stevie wonder folks yeah and uh, what's really cool too, man, is so I've got a unique perspective too, which I feel more than fortunate to have spending time with Stanley, getting to yeah. get a little bit of the background, you know? So 
if I can just for for two minutes here shed some light on yeah man on what Stanley shared is it's this it's that Stevie likes stuff to be super simple and I had seen some videos of Stanley playing with Stevie like years ago when Stanley had dreads when he was just like young early twenties and. Uh, he was playing Superstition pretty busy and I was like man this feels and sounds great it is definitely busy but it sounded awesome like Stanley can't do wrong right so yes. then a few years later uh, they had um, we'll just say they had, a, they had a new music director who had worked on a bunch of Michael Jackson stuff and who had worked with Stevie early on and was back back in the camp and he pulled Stanley aside and said, "Hey man, why are you playing? Why are you playing a bunch of these songs this way? Where you're like playing on them all busy?" And Stan right. is like, "Oh, I don't know, man. Like, you know, it's just no one's ever told me otherwise, and and it and it feels good and whatever." And he said, "Yeah, man, but like you're playing it wrong." And Stanley was right. like, "What? You know?" <laughs> So and Stanley talks about this in our in our videos at 180 that we've got with Stan where we where we uncover a bunch of Stevie grooves and we get into a bunch of you know Stanleyisms mm-hmm. is that uh, he went back and really recalibrated and learned all of those parts uh, you know to their truest rendition and one thing that's really interesting is he plays Superstition now very simple off the intro no chops whatsoever and he plays with two hands he plays that hi-hat intro not doubling a lot of his right hand notes but using two hands so that's the kind of thing that he talks about you know stevie did is stevie wasn't a super you know technical drummer so he would just play things whatever was the easiest there's no rules you know so yeah man that that's that's so amazing thank you for sharing that story it's incredible um I mean, the the unique thing that that Stevie has is he. What I would assume, and this is this is purely speculation, but I would say it's safe to say that Steve, when Stevie's crafting his songs, he's thinking about everything, maybe simultaneously is what I would assume. In that he's thinking of the groove, he's thinking of the melody, he's thinking of the harmony, he's thinking of the arrangement, the structure. So it all sort of seamlessly integrates, and and that's and that's why he plays what he does he he knows what the other parts are going to be um and has this sort of holistic concept of his tunes um that really come through um and and and, and simplicity is what is what serves those tunes he might be one of the best all-around musicians um ever it's so yeah. it's so tough right like that's such a huge statement but yeah I don't know that it would be uh, I think that it would be debated by few but probably accepted by many I would not refute that <laughs> yeah yeah he's just such a talented musician man on on so many fronts lyrically uh, melodically uh, rhythmically just yeah in, insane man insane and Crazy. and he's a and he's a pop star which is rare with people that are technically proficient yeah is they usually don't connect with the you know with the masses but yeah come on stevie no problem (laughs) levon helm yes levon helm dude another big influence on stanton man yeah um levon is i mean he his work with the band amongst others and and I mean, he's also a multi-instrumentalist. He is also a singer. So he's also sort of another epitome of that play for the song. He's often singing and playing at the same time, which is hugely commendable and very hard for those of you out there who have given that a shot. Yikes, not me, not this guy. um, Yeah, I've been been trying lately, like playing along to the band records and really anything now I've been trying to sing along with. And it's... It's, it's kicking my ass, but it, I love it. Um, but dude, Levon has just such an incredible spirit. I, I, if if you haven't watched his DVD, go check that one out. Um, he just is a very special person. Music aside, he just has this incredibly uplifting spirit, and it shines through um, in his music and his work with the band. So he is another one of my all-time favorites, and. It's just such a heavy groove, but just such a, a play for the song type dude that has had such a massive impact and inspiration to me. So can't speak highly enough about Levon Helm. 
Oh man, so great, dude. And, and what's some of his? Uh, what What else are some some tracks that you'd say are, are immediate? Go listen to this. This is gonna capture Levon in a few songs. Don't do it. Don't do it. The band. Hey, just just check that one out. And that's linked. Um, but, that's linked right on the right in the article, guys. Go check it out. But go check out his. So his uh, the the DVD is um, ain't in it for my health. That's the name of the DVD. Ain't in it for my health. <laughs> oh, that's great, man. I'm I'm itching to go play drums right now. I'm, I'm yeah, itching, right? man. <laughs> oh, yeah, Levon's amazing, man, and um, just the feel, the touch on the drum set. Again, another guy who doesn't have chops, like an yep. insane amount of chops, and it is the best thing that ever happened, you know? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, Plays you guys, what the song requires. Yeah, man, you can you cannot have chops and make history. I think that's the goal to today's... Yeah. You know, is it, it, you know, it exists in the groove. That's where the magic happens. Amen. Dude. <laughs> All right, next... Next, we've got the the choppiest groove guy ever. I think I think ever because when it comes to playing patterns that revolutionize the way we play drums, David Garibaldi is like he's way up there to me, man. He is way way up there. He might be at the top of that potentially. potentially. Dude, his 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 stuff with Tower of Power is just sort of revol- revolutionized funk music r&b music soul music um he is one of my favorites another one of the dudes that one of my earliest drum teachers introduced me to i forget what one of the first grooves we worked on but but i can always remember every time i would go up those stairs to those early on drum lessons he would be playing some tower of power and i would just lose my mind that was my early introduction to to David Garibaldi and have since gone to to check out all of his stuff. And there's so much goodness. There's so much good playing with Tower of Power. And uh, if you haven't checked him out, go do it. It is a must. He will change the way you think of crafting grooves and playing all the in-between, all, all that funky goodness, but but still maintaining like what's necessary for the song. And it is just such a big part of the Tower of Power sound and has you know again gone on to influence thousands of of players that have come after him yeah man my first exposure to david garibaldi uh you know right away guys go check out a song like soul vaccination and get yourself keen on because i feel like that song really well captures the some of the some of the technicalities of overlapping accents between your right hand and your left hand where you know the most foreign part of that groove is the back half of the of the verse groove where the accents on the snare are coming down and your right hand is on an up, <laughs> up you know and it's just so yeah. it's so counterintuitive right yeah yeah and it's crazy because like as as fun like those grooves are almost like exercises in yes. and of themselves but yes. they are so funky and so groovy Ugh. but they will like so develop that like um up down thing that you do on a like if you're ghosting a note right before a backbeat that's where i learned that david yes. garibaldi and that is so funky and just makes the groove so much more sort of interesting and and just funky man that's all i can say <laughs> oh dude so yeah guys go go buy future sounds um yeah go get that book ASAP and it's funny because there's another book that I own from Garibaldi that I can't think of the really colorful uh, what's another I know book? what you're talking about but I can't think of the name oh that's awful um, but yeah, <laughs> go, go check out a bunch of uh, Tower Power stuff and just just immerse yourself in it because it's truly like just next next level man amazing yeah. playing yeah. an amazing yeah. sound on the drum set yeah. uh, such a tight dry unique rhythmic just man he's got it all dude he's got it yeah, all man Love um it. why can't i remember the name of this book it's gonna bother me i gotta try and remember book i'm sure google can tell you uh the funky beat baby yes yes that's the one that was the yes. book for me yeah 
Yeah, big fan. Um, I'm actually like I'm getting really itchy now to go play all this stuff again because it's <laughs> it's something that you know you kind of learn it and then you move on from it and you right. you should come back to it. You know? Oh, I always come back. It's in my like shed practice little playlist, which is another one that I'll, I'll send. Like I have a playlist that I like. It's got some some gads. It's got all these guys that we're talking like some of my favorite tunes that I always come back to and and shed just because there's always new stuff that I'm discovering in them and and it I, I love like the constant reminder to force the playing of these dudes to rub off on my playing and whenever I yeah. revisit those Garibaldi tunes it's it's crazy <laughs> love it well man here's a little bit of a background on the way I was introduced was definitely with those books the funky beat was the first book that I was introduced to but man, the guy that taught me this stuff, he's a drummer named Graham Lear. Now, to those of you that are younger, that might not mean anything. And when I actually started studying with Graham, it was purely off of uh, one of my relative's recommendation. But Graham Lear was one of Santana's earlier drummers. Huh. And he is Josh. Like, it's funny because you might not even be like Graham Lear. Like, I don't, that doesn't really ring a bell. Yeah. But Graham Lear is, I think, one of the one of the most uh, underrated drummers potentially out there because of the history of the stuff he's played on. Um, but due to the the intense lack of recognition that he got, uh, so when I mentioned his name to older drummers, everyone was a fan of Graham Lear. Wow, uh, it's crazy, man. So. He really introduced me to the Garibaldi stuff because, you know, they go back. They have a, a history and a, pa a past. Um, obviously, because Santana was at one point one of the biggest bands. And he was this dude from Toronto out playing with them. And uh, so he was, he's a dude that I'm, I'm fighting hard to get into 180. He's, he's a friend of mine. He's really trying to be careful with where he goes and what he does. But uh, the last time I talked to him about 180 was like two years ago. So I've got to give Graham, I've got to give him another call. Yeah, man. See if I'm gonna can. go check him out. I, I, I do not. That name does not ring a bell to me. And I will certainly after this go check him out. Yeah, dude. Gino Vanelli he played on a lot of Gino Vanelli stuff. Okay. Like Yonder Tree, and these are all records that, yeah, you guys got to go check out. It's actually it's it's some pretty gnarly stuff. And he introduced me cool, to not only, you know, David Garibaldi's playing, but this is another drummer that is very heavily, um, again, underpopularized. He's not a very popular drummer, and that's, right. uh, that's Ro Robbie Amin. So if you go check out a book called um, Funkifying the Clave, pretty sure that's what it's called. Um, Love that name. <laughs> Funkifying the Clave. I'm just double checking right now. Boom. That's the book. So it's Af Afro Cuban grooves for bass and drums. It's a, a bass guitar and a drum lesson book in one. And what's really cool is the DVD is set up for both the bass player and the drummer to have isolated parts to learn Dude. and then learn to play together. So I have forever been looking for a bass player to uh, to accommodate me in some <laughs> jamming. But Robbie Amin, my understanding is Robbie Amin was uh, a part of influencing David Garibaldi as well. Uh, and I mean, as well as someone who was heavily himself influenced by, I think it's more the other way around that he was influenced by Garibaldi, but he really, really captures that Latin sound and in, in the most amazing way, uh, covering, you know, everything from the Songo to the Mozambique and just really breaking stuff down in a beautiful way. And he's also a guy that's played with Wayne Krantz a bunch, um, which is amazing stuff to check out, filling in for a guy like Keith Carlock. Uh, wow. just, just some some heavy people that I feel like don't get enough enough coverage. So go check that cool, out, man. Robbie I Amin, will definitely. Yeah, Robbie Amin, Lincoln Goins, Funkifying the Clave. I'm writing that in right now too. Sweet. Cool. Funkifying the Clave. So yeah, that's a wicked that's a wicked uh, wicked little rabbit trail to go down for everybody listening. I will go down that rabbit trail. <laughs> and next, dude, we've got another guy that I've got a little bit of a story to, and this one is going to show how young and ignorant I was when I first met Brian Blade. So, I mean, dude, why'd you, put Brian, why'd you put Brian Blade in this list? I have no idea why he would be in this list. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, like, 
I mean, I, I think objectively, he's just like one of the best drummers of all time that will ever live. He is yeah, I don't disagree. such a chameleon, has such a deep pocket, but yet can swing his ass off. Oh. And has played with Wayne Shorter, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, and a million others. And Daniel Lamois, it, it, dude. Oh. Like, like spanning every single genre and I mean another dude that I can talk about for for days he is absolutely insane and there is so much good YouTube footage of Brian Blade like hour plus long concerts that you can just kick back and geek out to and he is just oh my god so filthy so filthy yes okay you ready for my Brian Blade story of the day? Let's do it. This has got to be, this has got to be seven years ago. Um, I was just explaining that I went to this music conference that was highlighting Daniel Lanois as a producer. He produced uh, some very famous U2 records. He's probably one of my hometown's most iconic music industry uh, professionals. And yeah, man. Just amazing. Daniel Lanois is amazing. So. He was being kind of like just introduced and I was young seven years ago, didn't really have any idea who Daniel Lanois was. Right. Um, and there was this, there, there was this drummer playing with him. This guy that to me sounded absolutely amazing, but I had no idea who he was. Uh, afterwards, after the performance, I went up to that drummer and was like, man, you dude, that sounded so great. You killed it gave me this huge big hug and this big embrace and the next month I got the cover of I think it was uh, Modern Drummer and guess whose face was on it? This guy's face, Brian <laughs> Blade. So needless to say man, I was a little bit um, kicking myself for not knowing who he was at the moment meeting him and same with Daniel Lanois. I met Daniel and I didn't really understand who these guys were being young and ignorant but they were so gracious. And Brian Blade, you know, not only did he blow me away that day by having just some of the craziest musicality, it was just him and Daniel Lanois on stage playing. They were just jamming, like completely jamming. They said they had no plan of what they were going to play. And uh, it was beautiful, man. It was so cool. So there's a little background of me and Brian Blade. Amazing. Yeah, man. And I've actually since then reached out a few different times to his management and uh, they even speak. It's so cool to hear them talk about Brian from their perspective because I reached out about meeting Brian. This is going back a few years when he was playing in town with Daniel Lanois. And uh, immediately his management's like, man, Brian's such a special guy. He doesn't carry a cell phone. He doesn't have any technology with him on the road. He actually carries a typewriter and he writes and typewrites. Um, so dude, he just, he's a, literally a living legend. Brian Blade is a living legend. Unbelievable. Love that guy. Another one of those, like much like a, a Levon Helm, his, his spirit. And I don't know him personally, but he's just, he seems like one of those dudes who's just so mellow and so just like easygoing and just has this, I mean, he's, he's, I've never seen him play the drums and not smile. That, that, yeah. that speaks volumes to like what kind of person I think he probably is. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, when, when I was that young kid going up to him, telling him he played great, it could not have been more meaningless by most people's standards because I'm just some young guy. But dude, right away, he grabbed me, gave me the biggest hug, and acted like it was the first time anyone in the world ever gave him a compliment. It was just, wow, he, he's that guy, for sure. Incredible. Yeah, Incredible. amazing. And you've got a bunch of great videos, man, again, like... The fact you've taken the time to dig into all these guys and actually put yourself out online, you know, uh, trying to imitate them is so cool, man. It's so exciting uh, for everyone that's watching this, listening to this, and then going to go check out the blog and watch these videos. I think you're going to be super inspired. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Um, all right, dude. The last guy on this list, uh, Al Jackson Jr. Yeah, man. Um, I, and, and sort of not even purposefully putting him last, but he's probably inspired every single person on this list to a great degree. Um, his playing with, you know, I listed a few Otis Redding, Al Green, 
uh, Booker T. Like, I mean, all of these records and artists have gone on to influence, again, the, the landscape of pop music and soul music and R&B music. And um, I mean, Steve Jordan will talk about how Al Jackson Jr. is one of his biggest influences ever. Um, and man, just go check out all of those Otis Redding records that he's on. His groove is just so infectious and, and deep. And man, he is he's one of my favorites of all time for sure. Dude, Al Green, Tired of Being Alone, that <laughs> out of tune almost Tom is yeah. the most beautiful sounding. It's just such a cool sound, man. Such a beautiful sound. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. man. Big fan. <laughs> yeah, definitely go check out the Al Green stuff, guys. Like for that... Like kind of laid back, uh, laid back soul yes. vibe. He just aces it. It's so in the pocket. Yes. Yeah, big time, man. So, guys, definitely check that out. And uh, you included a great Otis Redding track too. So, man, I'd encourage all you guys to to go dig into this stuff. Um, man, Josh, thank you so much, dude, for taking the time to put together such an insane list while you're away jumping on the podcast with us it's so appreciated man dude thank you so much for having me this has been incredible and and if i am so down to to dive deeper if you ever want to do another one of these things this is great i loved it yeah i definitely think we will man um and i appreciate all your time because we stole you far longer than we were supposed to to the point where it sounds like right now you're probably jumping in your car buckling up and uh getting ready to hit the road because yeah man your time has just been awesome today dude we covered so much for everybody listening head to 180drums.com forward slash josh t and check out this blog like if if we haven't made it clear enough i'm questioning your love for the drums and for pocket (laughs) because it's just like dude you put together such a great such a great article man that is so inspiring like i am i am now past the point of being itchy i'm just ready to go sit at my drums and play asap dude me too like me even just like talking about all these dudes while they naturally fit into my inspiration daily for music like talking about each one separately i'm like kind of geeking out all over again for these dudes yeah me too man like so everyone listening knows where i personally am gonna dive in is i'm gonna dive right back into the funky beat with garibaldi I'm yeah. going to go back and listen through all the meter stuff again. And I personally want to go back and listen through a bunch of uh, of Bonhams playing. Those are the guys that right away I was like, man, I want to dig into more of that. And Al Green, man. Even the yeah. stuff with you know Al Jackson Jr. Um, digging into more of that. There's just so much goodness, man. So much. Endless amounts. Endless <laughs> amounts. Dude, Josh, you're getting hit by rain over there, huh? We are. It's pouring. Pouring here. <laughs> I'm not used to this. This is like, this is foreign to me now that I live in LA. Yeah, you got to take some of that back with you, man. LA's getting dry over there. Right, right. 100%, man. 100%. Well, Josh, you have been such a great guest on the show. For everyone listening, I hope you recognize that Josh is more than just a guest. The dude is my buddy. Uh, we got to hang out at NAM this year. That's a little bit of a background I probably could have provided. Yeah, man. Uh, is that we actually got to spend some time together. And uh, Josh is just such a good dude. He was so patient with me running around NAM and um, <laughs> disappearing frequently. <laughs> and, uh, man, I can't wait to hang with you again, dude. I'm really looking forward to that, man. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Jake, for your time today. I appreciate it. And this was a blast. Let's do it again for sure. Done deal, man. Well, dude, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you soon, bro. All righty. Thanks, man. Have a good one. There you go. There's 20 drummers right there that have totally changed and shaped the drumming community. If you want to take one thing home from this podcast today, instead of going and checking out all 20 of these drummers, just choose one. Go check out the records they've played on. Go check out some live videos. Every single one of these drummers has something worth learning. In addition to that, definitely go check out the show notes at 180drums.com forward slash Josh T. Up there, we're going to have a Spotify playlist that features all of the drummers that we talked about today. We're also going to have some cool stuff about Josh up there too. I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you did, please leave us some feedback. Tell your friends, maybe tell your grandma, you know. But other than that, 
Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.